Hello, beautiful light-filled souls. My name is Trisha Barker, and I am here with Human Amami, and he is really a fascinating guy. I haven't heard his full near-death experience yet, so I'm excited to hear it today, but I have talked with him about his spiritual journey and his uh, interest in Brazzo and John of God and the healing that can occur for so many people. And I'm inspired by his spiritual path, and I would like for you to go ahead and give a brief overview of who you are and where you're at, and then just jump into your near-death experience story, if you don't mind, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so, a little bit about me. Um, I didn't... Well, where should we start? Should I start with, okay, I'll, I'll quickly go over the, the bit about uh, educational background and then my travels. So I, I just, I did a lot of philosophy and religion in my undergrad studies and also holism and consciousness. And most of my learning began after my first near-death experience. And how old were you uh, at that 17, point? 17, 17. So actually, one peculiar thing about my near-death experience was that um, I hadn't learned uh, or read a single book until that time, learned from reading in, the, in that sense. So that was, um, uh, sometimes people don't believe me because I did go to school, but uh, I really managed school with just uh, a lot of... Um, just uh, getting by with memorization techniques and things like that. So I actually didn't. So that's one thing. Uh, I, I became a really avid learner immediately after. So then I started studying philosophy and religion, and I especially loved studying the lives of the mystics and the saints. And that just became my career. And then I did a detour in uh, computer science. And then I was in the academic world and decided I wanted to go more in depth. And to do that, I transitioned again and went on travels around the world pretty intensively for 12 years. And what were uh, you looking for during those travels around the world? I, I heard you in one video talk about being a miracle chaser. Yeah, so one of, one of the things was I... I, my awakenings happen uh, when I when I really sort of simplify it. Let's just say they happened in three three or four cycles. Um, but the near death experience was one major cycle. Another major cycle was an encounter, a divine encounter with Christ. Which, by the way, I'm doing my thesis. I'm trying to do a graduate postgraduate thesis on intuition and theophanies and the word theophany is divine encounter amazing it, it's the it's the the uh philosophical you know spiritual divine philosophers let's say terminology and actually my people i really admire are divine philosophers sages and scientists those are the people, especially from the Eastern cultures, that I identify with. In other words, their lives and so on. And as soon as I had my near-death experience, the books I was inspired by were those. Were those. And um, So you're immediately drawn to them right after the near-death experience. Yeah. You started reading these types of right. books. Right, right. And... Um, then I got back uh, in, in the academics after 12 years of traveling. Um, so I was saying the cycles of awakening. And, and then before traveling 2005, uh, I had another huge shift. So the near-death experience was sometime in 93, 1993, 94. And then 2005, it was a year, my near-death experience was a year after I moved to the U.S. Um, from what, Dubai, from United and, Arab Emirates. And what exactly happened? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, because we're going to come back to this, I think, let me just say, 
so the travels uh, were another step up from the near-death experience, which in 2005 happened, which was a, the divine encounter with Christ. Then I went on my travels, and then I worked all over the world and, and met with people like such as those you mentioned. And I called myself a kind of an independent pilgrim, researcher, but more so I describe myself as more of like a mad spiritual scientist or something. I don't know. So and I what, just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper with stuff. And what is that path like? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who long for that, but it seems like it would be, well, the freedom is amazing and wonderful on one hand. You know, it's beautiful and you're open to intuition, I would imagine. But does it get lonely and frightening at times when you didn't know where you're going to go next? And mm. So, uh, um, I think, well, I, let's put it like this. It's going to be whatever we talk about, the challenge I'm going to have is um, it's not something people, especially people probably who are going to listen to us, it's not something they're unfamiliar with. They understand this paradigm that I'm going to talk, be talking about and we're talking about. But um, I actually thought about this beforehand. It's coming to me now. Um, so that's another thing is um, it's like uh, in the present moment when I pay attention, we've already had these conversations. So then that kind of starts to get louder. Um, so this conversation sort of has been prepared for. As I, as I put it, we've been set up So mm -hmm. uh, already. So... Um, so there's a few things. One is that I love everybody on this path. I want to say that beforehand because I know I'm going to say some things and I think everybody says some things that trigger certain people or push some buttons more than others. So that's probably going to happen with me, but uh, I want to say I love everybody on the path, on the spiritual path of all faiths, religions, spirituality. And I think they're all interwoven. And one of the sort of the, um, emblem, if you will. One of the flags I carry is a saying from Molana Jalaluddin Rumi. And he says, beyond, I, out there, beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field, a garden. I'll meet you there. Mm, I'm familiar with that quote. It's so, beautiful. Yeah, it's a famous one. Everybody quotes it. And that's probably, a, uh, you know, usually the translations, you have to retranslate them several different ways to get to get get what he said but anyways it's close enough and so having said that uh, um, I'm sort of uh, blunt and sharp in a sense with my words because I think that's important to to and and the, the teachings and the teachers and the let's say the inspirations I have and the experiences I have with spirit uh, are, are such that uh, I'll be speaking in, in that way. Uh, that, uh, probably a little more direct than maybe some people are used to. I don't know. But, uh, but I just want to say that beforehand because probably different subjects are going to come up. Then we're going to use words like holy books and Christ. And, but I want to say that there is a meeting place for all of them. Mm. And then there's a way to... Uh, 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 really uh, go for the gold, so to speak, or go for the, for the truth in all of them. There's I, a way. And, and, and that way is the way of the heart, and we'll get more into that. But I agree. I, I anyway. agree with what you're saying. And I am going to pull you back, though, to your yes. young age with the near-death experience, and we'll you start there. So, so tell me about your near-death experience, and then we're going to uh, move into a lot of these topics. <clears throat> Okay, so and, and I explain that because speaking of my near-death experience, it's very hard to speak only in linear terms for me about anything. Yes. And that's because I think that anything we speak of, anything spiritual we speak of, anything beyond the third dimensional reality is, uh, uh, needs to have the presence of spirit. And this is a subject I often speak to because people skip, as I, as I like to put it, people often skip the basics. 
um, <clears throat> they censor God, they censor spirit, they sense, and then they get into like different movements and different this and that things that are hip and hyped and in and all of that. Um, but so I'll uh, tell you my experience, but this is what happens every time I tell it. So I'm telling you beforehand. I'm going to tell you a little bit of the linear, but then it's almost like the present moment awareness is where the, the, the real experience is. So, um, but the linear sort of time frame about a year after I'd moved to the U.S. was actually a very funny moment. It was the least expected moment. And it's probably one of the only, I've heard of maybe two or three other stories. I've heard of one great sage named Ramana Maharshi who had an experience like mine. Um, I haven't heard of that many, uh, or in fact, any who have had an experience of near death like mine, because mine did not happen with an accident or a tragedy, uh, number one, but it very closely resembled uh, death and dying. In fact, so much so that when the experience happened, I was told that this was a communion with death, that this was an encounter with death. And then sometimes people in various spiritual traditions, they have something they refer to as the spirit of death. But that's more of a negative experience. Like, uh, like, so, that, so that's more of a fear of death sort of thing haunting you, like a disease or, or something. But in my case, my experience was um, um, something came over me and my visual field completely transformed. And uh, I started to see a lot of different things in the ethers and in the space. And uh, so I was pretty young. I was still not spiritual or religion, religious in any way. I, I, my family is not religious or spiritual in any way, except that they're very humanitarian. Both my parents, their whole lives, they spent in public service. Um, and so I, um, I was uh, concerned. But I remember very, very immediately, as soon as I became concerned, I heard, um, something quite audible uh, say to me, and we were in a public space. We were at the movie theater of all places. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was going to ask if you were in bed or <laughs> if you were just, yeah. Wow. No, and the movie was just about to begin. And it was my, as I said, I was a, like a junior in high school, my f first year in the U.S. Uh, um, and... Um, the only thing I remember being told by some, by that presence, and I, I didn't have any reference or any word for it, you know, like I couldn't, now I, I know a lot of different ways that spirit communicates and so on and so forth. But then I, so all I, all I felt was that this is good. So I, I just kind of said to myself, this is good. It's okay. And the next thing that happened was, uh, um, it increased the moment I said that the intensity increased. And so then I, 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 well, I went back and forth between being frightened and, and not, and not. And then every time I was frightened, I tell myself, this is good. That's how the experience kept increasing in, in dosage, so to speak. And so what, what happened is I, and I've had awakening experiences since then, to a lesser degree, but when it, when the usually you know when new cycles it's like a rebirth. When the first cycle comes, it's very strong. So it was like that, um, and it's this combination of heat and liquid nitrogen cold that almost comes in from like within your veins and cells. It's this indescribable chill and heat. I think that there's something to that in a spiritual way because I know that. Now when we pray and do different things that we do, uh, and a lot of people do, they understand this. They have different terms for them in different traditions. But basically, when the, the intensity of the fire of spirit increases to a certain point, it turns into a, a, a mix of, of heat and, and a kind of cold that is really indescribable.
And you were feeling that in the movie theater, like mm-hmm. your body felt yeah. that kind mm-hmm. of dis- indescribable mm-hmm. heat and coolness. Yeah. yeah. Did anyone I, around you notice? And my visual field had transformed into all the stuff I was seeing. Mm-hmm. And the stuff I was seeing was neither good nor bad. I had no sense of good or evil about it. I just had a sense of, wow, like it's a lot of stuff, as if I'm seeing a lot of different kinds of creatures. Um, and also a little bit like when you look under the microscope and you see the, 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 the molecules dancing, it was also like that. Mm. So it was this very strange. And, you know, another side note is, you know, at that age, a lot of kids smoke stuff and experiment with drugs. And, and I, I, I've often known intuitively I'm very sensitive and I never wanted to try any, anything like that. So I also had no background in that. Did you fear that someone had slipped something in your drink? <laughs> no, no. It, it, I, I intuitively knew this ha- had something to do with, with the state I was in. And the state I was in at the time was about a year, roughly about a year. It, it was at the maybe four or five months, I have to think about it, but about three to five months into that period of being very silent. I was going through a space of being very silent. And the reason I was very silent is, Having moved to the U.S., the culture shock culminated into these very deep questions. And so I started becoming very introverted um, and asking these questions. And then asking very genuinely why we're here and whether I wanted to stay here. But not in the sense of contemplating suicide. Although I grew up being very sort of daredevil is is what they say i guess like i really always push the envelope so to speak but in my own private way like not so much like by being a rebel outside and getting in trouble a whole lot but more like i ate poisonous fruits as a kid i i mean i did a lot of like things where i didn't even think about it i just did those things Hmm. i climbed i climbed very high trees with no harness and And the funny thing is a lot of people that have near-death experiences, you hear about them doing very risky things afterwards to replicate the experience. In my case, it went just the opposite. I did a lot of crazy things very easily. And after this experience, I progressively became much more careful Mm. about uh, how I treated my body, about how fast I drove cars. I mean, I drove cars a little bit crazy, you know, but don't recommend it. But things like that. So, yeah quickly you was the movie going on while all of this was happening and you were just in the state would you say it was for most of the movie and what did you feel afterwards so yeah going back to that so because because i was aware or and familiar with all these crazy experiences before where i'd pushed the envelope i think intuitively i had been set up i i had the 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 training from mother nature and universe because i always ran away into nature or I just played really hard. I had no team. I, I didn't really have that much. Uh, people loved me, but I often struggled with what friends were or who, what kinds of friends you have. So, so the, 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 while having the experience, something intuitively told me, uh, uh, let it be you, like you're okay. You've been, you're okay for this. You're, you're ready for this. Except that I didn't have ref- a reference for it. And so it lasted about four hours and it kept intensifying. And then uh, there's a couple other funny things going on in the background meanwhile, which was because I was new to the U.S., um, it was my first introduction to like women really liking me. And it was really funny. There was like really, it was, it's just a mix of stuff going on was really interesting. And all of that was happening that night together. Uh, <laughs> So, so I was, you know, okay, I'll, I'll put it very simply because that's literally what was happening. So I'm sitting at the theater and unbeknownst to me, a girl to my right and a girl to my left are, are competing over me. And, and I'm trying to watch the movie. I barely know them. I had just met them. And, and then it was just the beginning of when I had learned to drive. So I told them, eventually I told them, I have to go home. I think I'm coming down with a flu. Meanwhile, I knew it wasn't a flu. But the the other interesting thing was that whatever this was, 
at the moment, I didn't have any name or any way to reference it, but whatever it was, it was a force that absolutely nothing could resist. That, that, that I remember. The other thing was what was comforting about it. It was very scary. It was very frightening to my nervous system, to my mind. But what was very comforting about it, and this is the difference between mind-altering substances and very genuine uh, spiritual experiences, because most people that try to induce mind-altering substances into these types of experiences, this, the, this is the part that's missing. And the part that's missing is you're very alert and aware of, of the transition between your ordinary mind and heart, I should say. And, and that so-called altered state. I'm so glad that you said that. I haven't yeah. heard that articulated before, and mm -hmm. I'm not drawn to any of the practices where people, you know, take different drugs to simulate near-death experiences or to have those spiritual experiences because it, yeah, exactly what you're saying. It seems as if you might not be in as much of an aware state to follow that transition. And that's important because what you're comparing is who you were before and where you are in that altered state. And that's important. Yeah. And then also, so there's a lot of things we could go in that direction. I won't go too far, but what happens is you're already, for most people, there's already a state of fragmentation before even taking those types of substances. So they're, they're already fragmented. Then they take the substance now the field is already fragmented and wide open, you know, and then sometimes they say that if they're in the presence of a shaman and so on, it's kind of true, but most shamans that easily give substances to people are not real shamans. So then we get into another kind of discussion, but basically uh, most indigenous, like my own native culture is indigenous. In fact, even up to three generations ago, they're still living in, mud villages that are still flourishing like the ancient ruins we see in the u.s but imagine them flourishing still uh, so that's only two three generations back like my great grandfather was actually so that's another thing is it seems like i picked up the inheritance of my great grandfather in the in the in the in the lineage of the muslim mystics and the sufis so the legends so to speak that the great legends that I, I, I don't bring up names of individuals because I've met a lot of people that have blessed my path. I don't bring up names because I don't want to misrepresent. And I also, more specifically, I've been told not to bring up the names of certain people. But the, the, the Zoroastrian and the Sufi traditions uh, are, are basically in my nativity to begin with. And then with my awakening, these things return. So a lot of the contextual framework that I speak of is my own studies and the way that I've inwardly experienced these things. And mostly I rely on my inward intuition, intuitive wisdom, and then also all that I've learned because this enabled me. In fact, right after I had the experience, I started meeting individuals that were extremely advanced, spiritual seekers and masters, which was another rarity that rarely happens to people. And this was in oh, San Francisco, like a few years Bay after area. you're in the Bay Area? No, 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 right, right after. Right after. I mean, after. like, literally. Like, oh. in fact, sometimes I don't remember if some of them I had met just before or just after. But this period was this, this one-year period, roughly, where everything had come together, and then there was this explosion, and I had no reference for it. I was totally, it was totally new for me. Um, so... Um, did you notice that you changed immediately after that moment in the movie theater? I mean, did you notice that you started viewing the energy of people around you differently or were there just immediate changes or after effects? Yeah. Okay. So what, just, just, just to go back to that experience, but then I could tell, I could tell the transition. I know we jump around a lot. Um, this is my first time that I've actually interviewed someone. Um, oh, I know. And I'm yeah. excited that it's, that I get the opportunity. It's yeah. everything you say is fascinating. So it's hard to stay on one topic, but yeah. but yeah, I'm just kind of curious as this teenager, you know, how did you finish high school and adapt okay. to the changes? Yeah. So I headed back home that night. Um, I continue to 
uh, there was a there was a moment. Of, I th I think the most profound moment was reached. I remember still because I walked in. One of my close friends and my half sister, who's passed away now, they were at my house, and they were hanging out in the living room. And I walked in, and the first thing they said was, "What happened to you?" And then on the way home, that's another thing is that on the way home, so I was. This is what I was saying. I'd go back into my ordinary awareness and I could feel the goodness of this presence. And then I sensed the fear, but the fear was because of the vastness of this presence. And it wasn't fear of dying or fear of being the kinds of horrors that people associate with spirits or negative types of spirit encounters or experiences. Not that kind of fear, but more of the kind of fear where I was like, whatever this, well, the word for it now in, in retrospect is, is universal. But, but then I didn't have the word universal, but whatever this was, was so expansive and so vast that it had full control of everything. Because I remember thinking I can't drive, but this thing was telling me everything's okay. And I'd say, yeah, everything's okay. And then I'll drive. And when I drove the two ladies that were my high school friends home, because I had to drive each one to, to a different home, as I was doing that, uh, it was enabling me. Because, I, because the intensity of the experience was so much that I, I didn't think I could even walk. But it was like this presence was moment to moment to moment with me. Right? So, so then when I walked into the house, they looked at me, they said, what happened to you? They were shocked by what, what they saw, but they were sh shocked by the, by the, by, by the I, I think if I can remember, uh, it was like my body wasn't here, right? So probably they were shocked by that because I walked in, but probably it was like I wasn't here. I don't mean my body. My body was there. I wasn't here because... I was in this expansiveness with this presence. So you, and, and, it was and like my a body one... was just doing things. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so it was like a oneness that you were feeling, um, you know, with maybe God or the eternal. And Okay, so I, I, I told them, it, I'm okay, leave me alone. Oh, and then I took a walk. At one point, I remember to reduce the fear because my friend who was many years my senior, I told him, I want to describe something to you. I tried to describing it to him. I tried describing it to him. It helped suit my fear a little bit because he was a very spiritual man, but it didn't really help. I, I sensed that this is very unique. So then I went back and I went into the, to my bedroom and I laid on the bed and it was at that moment that I, I left my body, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And on the way, by the way, another thing was on the way back when I had dropped off uh, my rides um, and I was uh, driving, I, I was weeping, crying and saying, what is this? Who are you? And it was the kind of weeping, crying that comes from your guts. You know, it was not an ordinary. That's another thing that surprised me. Like everything that happened second to second was new for me but I had no reference words or concepts for it. I just remember my body doing these things. And then I, I, I just said, what, what are you? Who are you? And, and, and these guttural cries are coming out of my belly as I'm saying this. And, and you, got, you got to remember, I'm 17 years old, right? So I'm like, um, so when I, when I come home and I go back and lay down on the bed, uh, that moment of very intense guttural quaking inside uh, went to another level uh, and then when that happened at that moment I realized I'm confronted by death and when what it felt like was like my consciousness merged with the consciousness of death and I realized this presence is death and what people talk about when they talk about a dark tunnel and, and this dark void and absolute peace it was then that I realized that's what it was. So at that moment, I realized, so my understanding of what that is, is 
the angel of death. That's what I think of it as, the archangel. Um, the descriptions, and, and you know, the, there are many great saints and prophets uh, from many traditions that talk about angelic encounters and what angels uh, uh, look like. And in many cases, they talk about what angels feel like. So one of the persons who has had the most, the most angelic encounters that are very thoroughly described is the Prophet Muhammad, which unfortunately we don't get the right picture in today's media of real depth of the teachings of the Muslim mystics and the real peacemakers. In fact, even the word means peace, but they often misrepresent it. So we don't get the in-depth teachings, but in the teachings of the prophet and all of the blessed and beloved prophets, when they talk about, especially Old New Testament and the Quran, when they talk about the angels and angelic encounters, there are many interesting descriptions of them. And of course, years to come, I started to study these. And um, they speak of uh, vast, expansive, uh, interdimensional realities. Like they will say, like they're saying, sacred sayings of the blessed prophet Muhammad, that he would say things like, uh, you know, their, their wings span across timelessness, you know. Their wings spanned across timelessness? Yes. Interesting. The angels, right? Beautiful. So, 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 so in other words, angelic beings, uh, and sometimes people equate them with certain celestial uh, bound uh, entities. Like sometimes I've heard people talk about uh, entities like ETs and UFOs and this uh, this is also a lot of confusion again there. Um, angelic encounters, especially of the kind that I am uh, aware of in my experiences, are from the realms of, of oneness. And this is the God of Abraham and the prophets of Abraham. They speak of one. Oneness. Yes, the realm of oneness, which means really actually all of the abrahamic prophets which is very interesting because that's not the modern western conception we have we call them western religions they're actually not western they're from the east number one number two that's fine it's not a fight between east and west but we have the wrong sort of understanding because in the east uh for a good percentage of the population of the people in the east they understand there's a continuum of the teachings. And so then we get into the angelic beings and so on and so forth and the God of Abraham. This I put into context in the years to come. But let me go very quickly back to the near death experience so we can close this. So I understood it was the angel of death, but not with the words angel of death, but with all the descriptions that I have learned later, I understand that's what it was. Okay. The other thing is that, uh, that these presences I started to acquaint myself with are such that they're of the tr in, in, in such a way that they're not interdimensionally bound to any dimension. Okay, so they're not bound to any third or fourth or fifth or sixth or whatever dimension. So the oneness means that the all of all, the all in one, the one in all, in fact, the word Elohim is singular and plural, right? So uh, also the word Allah, which is close to Elohim, all of this is saying, um, the, the, the creator that is the light of the heavens and the earth in the Holy Quran, that's how the creator is described, Allah. Um, and, and in the Semitic languages, not in the and, and, and Anglo-American languages, which we say God, G-O-D, right? God traces back to idols and specific idols and dimensional entities. If you look up the etymology of the word God. Okay, so that also has a lot. But the creator in the Semitic languages is this creator of one and oneness. So I understood, without understanding the words, I understood I merged into that. And that became me and I became that angelic presence. And then I understood that I had a choice. And the choice was to stay or go. And um, probably at this point, my body is just laying on the bed. I don't know what it's doing. Um, and then we decide together and it's not a we, and it's very hard to describe it, but it's a merged state of being of presence and it's very expansive. And 
I decided I'm coming back. The interesting thing was the word God was not stated, but right. I knew I'm coming back because from now on, and I knew coming back, I said to myself, life is never going to be the same. Uh, your life's about, but without the word God, it's well, your life like is it, about God, but it was without the word God. You cut out a little bit. That's what I'm clarifying. Right. And right. you know, I'm glad you say that because I say God when I talk about my near-death experience, but it really was this presence, this love, this feeling, and it's kind of how we interpret that experience of being our soul in the presence of that presence and being a part of it. And, and so, yeah, God, the term itself, is just the only one I could pick because it seemed all-knowing and it seemed infinite. And that's why I said in the Semitic languages, even in my native tongue, uh, God is neither a deity nor named after an idol, the etymology, in any of them. Whether it's Allah or Elohim or Da in my native tongue, it's uh, Farsi, the Farsi language. I'm Persian. I also grew up in Dubai and United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, those places. Uh, so I speak Arabic and uh, Pers uh, Farsi. and um, But... In all of the Semitic and the Hebrew, I, I, I talk to my friends who speak Hebrew and I, I look these things up and it's my major, it's my thesis and on and on. The, the laptop is sitting on six holy books and I have like 20 over here and 20 over there. and That's my life. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, in the Semitic languages, uh, we don't have, uh, God is, is, is the all and the one. And so I think the, 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 the best translation, like Elohim is the one and the all. So, so it's the one in all, all in one. It's probably the, the closest translation you can have because it's everywhere, um, always, right? In everything. I like that. So you decided with that presence to come back for a particular reason? So... Um, Yes, and then I had no idea what happened. Uh, and, and the funny thing happened, which was that there was a, uh, I, I can't mention all the different details, but there was a sort of distant acquaintance. So this is why I say the deeply spiritual people walked into my life literally that very night. Hmm. People I distantly known, not many, there was just one or two here and there, uh, that very night, one of them knocked on my door right after my experience had ended. Um, and he was a, an extremely advanced uh, spiritual practitioner, um, someone you might call a, a teacher or a master. Uh, but to me, he was like a brother. <laughs> yeah, that's true. he was like, a, like an older brother to me. Mm -hmm. so, so he became one of my close friends and allies for a number of years. Uh, but this continued. I kept meeting people, and then I majored in it uh, in, in school, and on and on. So all of it came into context. Yeah. So then after, I took it about ten years to integrate what happened. But the first thing that happened was this is another thing. You know how in near death experiences they talk a lot about life reviews. So one of the things, and also a lot of near death experience stories that I hear, interestingly, they talk about trying to access that state where they were, right? Um, in other words, it's so profound and then it gets shut down, right? When they come back to the body through a tragedy or accident. So another interesting detail that I know is unique and different is that perhaps when it doesn't happen through accident or tragedy, such as in my case, such as in the beloved Maharshi's case, what happens is uh, thereafter, uh, so Ramana Maharshi had also an experience of a conscious dying, consciously dying. Uh, so I call it like a consciously but involuntarily dying. You don't, you're not making it happen, but, uh, but it's conscious in the sense that you're aware. So when the experience ended, everything stayed open. My mm -hmm. mind was completely disoriented. Like I didn't know how to, I had no reference for it. 
but everything stayed open and one by one by one within every week and month and three months and six months, it kept opening slowly. It's like, you know, when they talk about the life reviews they have, near-death experiencers, and all this very big thing, and they come back and they don't remember most of it, how it was. I don't know if... Or remember some of it, or... I don't know if they don't remember all of it, but there's certainly a lot of things happen at one point. And, and maybe that's a really good question to ask a lot of near-death experiencers, because I came in and out of that consciousness personally. So, you know... I definitely had morphine and I was in the hospital and I worried that I would lose the experience. But as soon as I came back to my bedroom and I was in the bed and I didn't take um, any painkillers, I only took Tylenol, even though I had this, you know, horrible pain in my back because I wanted to be clear headed. I closed my eyes and I could still connect with that field. So I could still be in the presence of angels and God in those months after the near death experience. But it, it, yeah, it was a conscious choice. So are you saying that you didn't have a conscious choice to go into meditation and, and experience it? You simply just stayed that way? So this is what happened. Uh, little by little, like imagine like a giant book, right? It was like that. And, and learning to, having no reference whatsoever, and learning to start to read that book. So mm -hmm. the first thing that happened was, uh, I became an avid learner at a rate that was unimaginable. And when I think, I don't even know how that was possible. Because for instance, I don't even know how it was possible for those books back to back to back to come to me the way they came to me. So, yeah. you know, so massive, massive amounts of reading was like eating for me. But right? I, I, I understand. I thought maybe because I was in the body cast, I was reading at that level. But when I look back at the amount of books that I read in nine months, I mean, I read so many books and I've heard through different scientific reports that like after a near death experience, sometimes your intellect has, you know, increased right after an experience like that. So I was like soaking up, you know, anything I could get my hands on the greatest books ever written in literature, but also spiritual materials. So it was this combination of going in those two different directions and if i write it out it would look absurd like there's no way i could have read that much in nine months mm -hmm. is that the way mm -hmm. it, you experience and then, and then over the years i learned like like for instance i now read the way i now read you know is i i you see this yeah so i i go uh i read spiritually as well as physically right it's actually like eating mm -hmm. it's, it's like drinking and eating it's very different than linear reading. And, and see, I didn't have the reference for this, but this was naturally happening. And in fact, I often, the reason why it took 10 years for to learn to speak of this in the right way was because, because the strangeness of it all, even when I, because see, even then I had no reference of the near-death experiencers because near-death experiencers and their story generally from that point of reference at that time now now i can put it in context and i can see but then anybody else's story i heard was usually far less intense in the moment so very often when i heard stories it was like uh, you know now if i see people the only people i see sometimes can better identify with are some of the new generations of children and adults who quote unquote are very gifted and crazy and out there, but also normal. So my experiences were becoming like that and then realizing that that's how they had always been and trying to cope with that. So when you say right. some of the kids who are very gifted, um, just to give me a reference of, can you give examples of what you're talking about? So some, sometimes they're not status quo considered gifted. Um, sometimes are some of them are silent communicators very telepathic they communicate to hundreds or thousands easily some of them have names famous names um, they're known in the different circles of different spiritual modalities um, some of them are the uh, they call them autistic and some parents have stopped using that term because I think that's a bit of a misnomer. It helps. These labels sometimes help crystal children and all the different kinds. Um, 
there are some books that some of the contemporary New Age authors have written about people. But I think most of it, again, when I would read that stuff still, it was like, okay, I can identify a little bit, but again, still what I am going through moment to moment, even now and then, was far more of an experience of presence that took a very long time to find words and even now to express in words. But the first things that happened, to put it back in a linear context, is uh, the early childhood visions and dreams that I had returned. And a lot of them were out-of-body experiences that commonly we call out-of-body experiences. But I think I'd rather call them journeys or something like, uh, you know, ex expansive sense of presence and journeying. See, because part of the difficulty also is when we use these terms that introduced by parapsychology or psych psychology, like out-of-body experience or subconscious or superconscious or whatever, Again, my studies taught me that a lot of these terms are introduced by often inexperienced and immature spiritual practitioners. Uh, right? Yes. So that's yeah. another issue. I, right? I know what you're talking about. Like these terms themselves are not accurate a lot of times. So as you're throwing them mm -hmm. out, it's like, well, who created that? Why was it created? You know, like it's better to just hear someone describe their experience. And I think that you're getting to the core of why I like talking to other spiritual people and people who've had profound near death experiences or other awakenings, because we can create a language in a sense that is a little bit different from just those terms. Mm hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because, because, because see, the, the, this is a, the, the other thing with, right, like in the New Age movement, there have been, at the turn of the century, one of, I consider him like my uncle or brother. Sometimes I call him, hey, Jiddu Krishnamurti. I consider him one of my first inspirations. He's amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, Albert Einstein was another. Gandhi was another. Um, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and Ibn Arabi, the Sufi. So these were back to back to back the books I read at the time. Um, so there was a, a, a sort of a culmination of these sci in, uh, scientists, divine philosophers, and so on. And um, so when when you go more in depth, you realize that it's even more delicate than a, a surgery. Let's put it like that. But when you have like someone like an experimental psychologist suddenly introducing like some modality of hypnosis. Right, and this person doesn't really have the spiritual training or the maturity or the ability of the, the presence of spirit. And the most important is actually the discernment. And this is something you want to know about. Often it interests you because of my other talks about profound healing miracles. So then I became a miracle chaser, as I say, because I learned this is where we started. I learned that going after God in a pseudo intellectual sort of culture and in city lives and all this, it's not doing it for me. So even after all these experiences, I went off for 12 years and traveled. And the most important thing I did is this, what I'm talking about is having a sense of presence that is so innocent that, um, uh, really directly see like my friends recently, they keep telling me they want practices. They keep telling me, like, how do you pray? You talk about prayer, but you don't talk about how you pray. Or And I'm going to stop you just for a minute because I, I do want to talk about that presence. And I sense it in Brazzo. I'm not as familiar with John of God, but that's one of the first things I noticed was this innocence. And I actually saw that in my encounter with Jesus, too. You know, and, and this is 2008 for me. I know you had an encounter like that, but I, I sensed that purity and that innocence and uh yeah, if you could talk a little bit more about that. So you sense that this connects to healing, in a sense? It connects to, see, anything we say that's spiritual, beyond this three-dimensional reality, if we don't want it to be words, if we don't want it to be concepts, if, if we do, that's one thing, right? Like we're academic person, we want to study this paradigm or that paradigm. But like that person that I was as a kid, wanting to know God pure and simple. And I didn't care about philosophies. 
then it's the uh, discernment of the presence of spirit and spiritual forces. And discernment means their manifest presence in the way that uh, it is to be now, right? Because if it's beyond the three-dimensional discussion that we're having, right? Then when, whether it's a holy book or a famous name or a practice or a near experience discussion we're having right now, whatever it is, if it's beyond this three-dimensional reality, then that presence which is more powerful and encompasses this dimension is the one needs to be the one speaking and invading the space we're in. So our discernment and our ability to be a witness of that manifesting into this dimension. So let me see if I get this straight. So the presence is more important than anything that Brazzo is doing, for example. So pulling that innocence and that intensity of presence is what manifests healing? And witnessing, some people call it gradation. Some people, and people have like different philo divine philosophers. And I'm trying to think of, you know, like Sohravardi, Avicenna, some of these great ones that I love, Mullah Sadra, some of these great divine philosophers, they talked about things like modulation, mediation, uh, 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 gradation of light and darkness, right? So I often say all of the great ones speak of light and dark. If you speak only of one or the other, you, you, you're at either or extreme and you're going to get yourself and others in trouble, which is the main problem with the new age. They jump from one extreme to the other, right? This is why I say we need to go really in depth with the sources as well, the sources we study. So presence is... is Discernment, we have a word in Farsi. It's a word that the Sufis use a lot. The Sufi sages, the Muslim mystics use a lot. And the word actually has no equivalent translation in the English language. It's a word that, the word is ma'rif or ma'rifa. Okay, ma'rifa. And uh, it comes from uh, what's loosely translated as direct knowing or gnosis. Um, but it actually also means loyalty, affection, um, the innocence involved in the context of that word. So in the way we use it in the Farsi language, we say like, so-and-so has ma'rifat, or so-and-so doesn't have ma'rifat, right? So, <laughs> and it's a good thing to have uh, ma'rifat. <laughs> right. I will, I will and say, you... Right, go ahead. Yeah, so you would say that Brato has it. And... So, but at the same time, though, having it is also about its manifest presence. And that, so discernment is another meaning of marifat. I said that. So, so discernment, affection, innocence, some kind of love, affinity, loyalty, they're all within the, this word, right? So I would based on the way it's used. So I was told to be like a little child, and that's kind of a biblical um, mm -hmm. verse. Mm -hmm. But this presence that you're talking about that I see in different people who are great healers, I think that is being a bit childlike in the sense that it is, as you describe, affectionate, loving, open. Is that, yeah. could yeah. that, those two be tied together in a sense? Right, but also the ability to, to uh, differentiate. Right? So discernment is about light and darkness and gradations and differentiation of the phenomena that's in the now mm -hmm. and the many phenomena that are in the now. Right? So let's take, for example, the one that, uh, since you bring up spiritual healing, uh, the man, let's say the man of the hour, the man of the moment, Mr. Bruno Groning, I love him very much. He was a prodigy. He was literally raising the dead as early as he could speak walk or talk okay bruno groning g-r-o-e-n-i-n-g 
uh, he healed masses of 30,000. He responded to masses of 80,000 letters at a time. Um, he was literally like getting people out of their deathbeds as early as he could walk or talk. Quite an amazing being. Um, and the more I've studied him, the more I've loved him. In fact, one of the reasons I've gone back into the academic world is because, uh, hopefully I'll get to that, is bringing, get to that meaning when I, in life I'll get to that. I don't have to get into that now. Because <laughs> because I might have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <I'm Yeah. eating. laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Um, uh, bringing him and people like him so that we understand that innocence we're talking about. Because he was aware, for instance, of the archangel of death hmm. sitting next to him. Wow. So this conscious awareness of, different spiritual phenomena being present and manifest and to what degree they're manifest. And that's a fascinating topic that really you could do a video on, or we could talk about right. at a different time because it, it goes in so many different directions. And a lot of people are afraid of this or they're not, they don't want to talk about this topic. And unfortunately I'm going here. <laughs> so uh, as you as you're bringing it up, I went this past Friday to an IANS event and there was a man there who had a near death experience and he lived in a haunted house and he had all these pictures of negative entities that he was catching on his equipment. And a lot of people were very turned off by him. And, you know, at some point I was too, because he supposedly captured both the devil on his television screen and God. And, you know, people were just like out, you know, done. But he, I saw, and this is what I kind of saw in the field, is that he had this light that was just pouring in. So all these spirits were just pouring through him and he didn't know how to control it, how to shut it off, how to deal with it. So he was manifesting all of these negative and positive entities. Some of them were telling him good things. Some of them were telling him bad things. And I tried to stop him and go, hey, we need to work on maybe shutting this off and being more in control of it. Have you, have you seen someone like that? Who, you know, maybe someone would say they're mentally ill, like they're schizophrenic, or um, what would well, you do if you saw someone who was manifesting that kind of connection to entity? Okay, yeah. So when you bring up subjects like that, I have a, I, I'll often default back to a very simple outlook. So... so uh, in, in this, the, what you're talking about is actually far more simple than, than, than what I was saying in the sense that, uh, you know, the spiritual uh, sort of uh, the levels of spiritual communities of different things going on. Um, to put it very simply and bluntly, and this is what my travels taught me is uh, and this is where I said I'm, I'm, I'll probably step on a few toes and push some buttons. But we're, we're in, in a sense, we're in deep trouble. In a sense, there's a lot of denial. Um, a lot of people that claim to be masters, gurus, teachers, healers, near death, I don't care about the label. You know, whether it's mine or anybody else's, it doesn't matter. Because we, we praise labels like I just talked about prophets and divine philosophers. But see, the point is that we actually don't understand any of it if the presence and the understanding and the awareness of presence is lacking. And so when we talk about innocence, if I were to tell you very simply, I said this to somebody recently, maybe that was way too blunt. I would say to one person like that, but I don't know if I want to say it here like that. But let's put it like this, that a very large percentage of what we call spiritual is actually not spiritual at all. And I don't care whether we say religious or spiritual or whether, you know, like if you study Jiddu Krishnamurti, what I loved about him and what I love about all of the great awakened souls is that they come out with the first thing they come out with is negation or renunciation as a practice of being present is very important, right? So I'm so, going to... Yeah, pushing... I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask you a question just so that I can better understand. So, yeah, I could see where this would step on someone's toes if you say most of what is considered spiritual is not spiritual. So that sounds like a criticism. What then, and maybe you're getting to this, what then is spiritual? You're saying it's the presence and the discernment, and no matter 
what religion or what practice, if you're bringing that, that beautiful presence and discernment, then that is spiritual. Yeah, so let's, let's go for a moment and look at Jiddu Krishnamurti's message because that clarifies it. So he negated everything. I mean everything, right? Every kind of teaching, every kind of teacher, every kind of guru, every kind of master. It really dumbfounded everybody. And what people don't know is that he influenced just about every major thinker of the 20th century to the point that he was with them. They were with him, like the Dalai Lama, like many, many, Khalil Gibran, Charlie Chaplin, Bruce Lee. I mean, you can go on and on. Many of the shapers of the 20th century, century George Bernard Shaw, Aldous Huxley, uh, I mean, actors, actresses, they would go and spend time with him in Ojai. One of the best books is the one written by Papu Jayakar uh, about Krishnamurti. But this was the most difficult thing was this, this for them to understand. Um, and sometimes even people today, they think he was mad or he was angry or something, right? But actually what I believe, because I actually had experiences with him, what actually I believe he was teaching and saying was when, including himself, he would say, negate me, right? I remember so, reading that. Right. So when you truly understand, you, you, when, you, when you are in that space of truth, right? Uh, like the experience, let's, let's talk for a moment, like the near-death experience, right? Okay, you're in this vast, expansive, ineffable, absolute something. And you have no words for it, right? And some people, the closest thing you could say is like you're in the sun or the closest thing you can say is like some absolutely peaceful vacuum or dark or tunnel or whatever. And none of it really conveys in, which is why we're ridiculed a lot, is because... People that come from other backgrounds ridicule these words, right? But if you were, let's say, like Ramakrishna, another great Indian sage, um, you could turn people's worlds around and upside down by being present without having to explain anything, right? And so you think that's what Bratso does is simply he brings presence or Bruno Gruning does is he brings presence and that's what facilitates yeah. the healing. And that's what Krishnamurti was doing. He was negating all and everything, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, as I'm speaking with you, I'm going to have to buzz in somebody. But he was <laughs> negating everything and everyone. Um, why? Because he had something to give in the presence, right? Yes. So, there we go. <laughs> sorry about that. So, he had something to give in the presence and in the present moment to everybody. And that something is a very unique, as I say, it's more precise than surgery. What God is giving in the moment between you and God and between me and God and between you and everything and all around you right now is as precise as the movement of the planets and the atoms and everything else that can't be one little 0 0.01 degree off. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you negate and renounce all falsehood, what is present is already manifest. You realize what is present is already manifest. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who is listening, and maybe this is where we'll have to end, because um, I don't know how long I can record on Zoom, but in a really simple way. So someone is very sick, and I get these people contacting me often. You know, maybe they're in, maybe they're young, but they're in the ER. Maybe they you know, have a deep illness, but they want very badly to heal, but something within themselves is preventing them from healing just in a simple, straightforward way from what you've learned as a miracle chaser and studying people like Bruno Gruning and, and others. What hope would you offer them or what could you say to those who are hurting in that way? Um, first of all, I would say don't take it on. Hmm. Don't blame yourself for anything and uh, reach out to resources uh, that help and especially resources that are freely given. 
I know this definitely pushes some buttons when you say this. Um, because the sun or the moon or the air we breathe doesn't say we have a $2,000 weekend workshop to give you life, right? Or 20 days and $50,000 to enlighten you, right? It, it just gives. So purity, innocence, God, love, spirit, it just gives. And um, the sources are out there. People need to, uh, I believe, have more faith in themselves in the sense that, first of all, they can give it to themselves. And secondly, the sources that are out there, that give to them. Um, these uh, holy people's places, um, places people can visit, um, powerful healing sources like Brazzo, like Bruno Groning, these places where they're given so much freely. And it's not about names of individuals. It's not about their personal characters. It's about the convergence of millions and thousands uh, uh, that, that freely share and give, right? It's also, it's also very helpful to think of it <clears throat> because people, the mindset of coming from a space of lack is that you don't have and you're sick and somebody else has and they're going to give you right? But actually, what I've come to learn is that, in fact, the people who are in authority of any kind, they need our help more than maybe they help us. So, um, you know, all of us included, you, me, whatever it is that we, we are some kind of, in some kind of leadership role of, right? So, it's very empowering and I think that people need to know that actually they have much more than they realize to contribute just by their presence. So for instance, if somebody is watching this, right? Like we could make this more sensationalized. We could do some of these things, some of these healing modalities of today in the new age. This is why I say most of it is not is because the presence that see the word essence is in presence so pre-essence so presence is so powerful that if God's presence you know right now there's like three four different things ringing at the same time so this in the physical space is happening in this building is presence um, our conversation is a kind of presence we could say some things that sound like prophecies. That could be a presence. Like we could say in the next three weeks or we could do some stuff like this and we could maybe do some stuff like this and whatever or gaze at people or something, right? And then say in the next like two, three weeks, this will happen or today this will happen, right? We could give like all this. But actually... More will happen if you realize none of this, all this game, not good or bad, just this game of living, none of it is actually about you or me anyways. More will happen if you just let presence be and then your entire world of definitions of things will shift. So that, for instance... What if this interview and someone who watches it uh, could help them for the next 10 years or three years and have 10 or 20 profound miracles in store for them because of presence, right? But if they listen on, on a level of, let's say, uh, their own criticism, their own judgments, their own whatever, maybe they'll get nothing. In fact, maybe after five minutes, they'll shut it off. Yeah, it's true. The vibration of a voice or the presence of a person, you know, that can be healing on some level, just as a gaze can or anything else can be. So yeah, there are different ways to listen. And that was, was a beautiful way to sum up everything. I think we are going to have to stop here just so that I make sure I can 
get this video into the space that I need to for Zoom. But thank you, Huban, for talking with me. This was lovely. Um, I, I love listening to your insights and your studies and your experiences. And there's so many different directions we could talk, but I really do appreciate this interview. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you as well. And bless you and all, all, all people who watch this and view this. And in, in the future, we'll hopefully learn to uh, narrow it down as well. And you'll keep me more focused. I don't mm -hmm. know. Because no, because I, I keep pulling you into the. Into the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun. Try to focus. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, yeah. it's it's fun. But uh, thank you a lot. And to anyone watching, please like and subscribe to my channel. And I hope to have another interview with you and others. But thank you. All right.